All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Patrick Riley, who is over just up the road here in Berkeley, over up in Northern California. How are you doing, Patrick? Correct. That's good. I'm good. Good, I good. feel good. I, I look good. At all that good stuff. Ready to chat. Excellent. And I'm here in lovely San Diego. And we're going to have another heat wave coming this weekend. So I'm sorry. I apologize in advance to those of you who are heading into a snowstorm. We're heading mm. into a heat wave. What can I say? All right. So Patrick is the president of Resources in Action, who specialize in executive coaching and consulting. And he's worked with business leaders for many, many years. And one of the core elements that uh, he really reinforces is the idea around goals, goal clarity, and and how to the strategies for achieving goals. So, I mean, first of all, um, Patrick, why is it that goal setting and goal clarity is still such an issue for a lot of people? Because I I see it all the time myself. Well, um, it. It, it seems like it might be easy, but it's much harder than that. And, it, and there's, a, there's a couple of reasons. Um, well, one is um, if you want to hit a target, you have to have focus and you have to have a goal. And, and for example, just there was the World Series was completed recently mm -hmm. and the pitcher and the catcher, if they want to hit the goal of getting the guy out, they set up a particular place and then you have to throw the ball to that particular place. So it's not so easy sometimes. Um, one of the other things that uh, makes it tough, I think, is that one of the essential elements in hitting your goals is to have clear intention. And for some people, that's not, not so easy. So I have to have some clarity, in mind, clarity of mind and focus in order for me to be clear what it is that I want to get to. So there is a energy and a focus of mind. Often uh, people develop that in a variety of ways. Some people, it's fairly easy. Uh, for a lot of people, meditation is a practice that helps them to develop that, that clarity of intention. Um, the other thing I think that is difficult sometimes is uh, a number of years ago, uh, when people started to explore goal setting in a greater variety of ways, one of the things is that uh, they, there was a tool called the balanced scorecard. Right. And people, uh, and what I found was that one of the problems is that people set the wrong goals. It's not so easy sometimes to set the, the right goals. And in particular, when using a balanced scorecard, for example, people found that it was a, the piece that was the HR uh, piece that was toughest for them to figure out. Uh, it wasn't as easy to get your hands on how many, uh, how many dollars of product do we have to sell? What's the efficiency in our processes? What do we have to do to provide customer satisfaction? So I think that that's a piece that makes it difficult. The other one just came up in a conversation I had yesterday with a client and his boss. And his boss said one of the things about Mr. X is he had really aggressive goals set. And he said they were impossible for people mm -hmm. to reach. So people got very frustrated. So when the concept of stretch goals got introduced, I think it was a great thing and it really helped people to push the envelope a bit. But sometimes, well, you know what happens, uh, John, you know what happens when you take a rubber band? A rubber band is a great tool, right? Terrific stretches out. You take it too far, it snaps. So yeah. that's the piece. So, it, so it's a big, big difference between stretch goals and snap goals. <laughs> uh, yes, I've never heard the term snap goals, but yes, you got the idea. Yes, <laughs> big difference. Yeah. And I do think I think this is a this is a, a critical point here because I do think that that's what a lot of people struggle with. They either set goals that are too vague, right, uh, yeah. or set goals as you say that are too aggressive or unrealistic. Yes, we all want to push ourselves and we want to achieve more than we possibly think we can. But if you set impossible goals, I mean, that's just the same as setting vague goals. You're not really ever going to get there, right? You, you, you don't get there. And when we don't get there, we get frustrated. Or when mm -hmm. others who are working with don't get there, they get frustrated with us. And uh, losing is losing, right? Not, not reaching your goals is losing. And that, that is never, ever a good experience. Um, you know, something else I thought of that I think is really important is that um, sometimes it's not easy for us to get clear what the goals are because for some people, it's very hard to think forward. Mm. And 
it requires some element of imagination. And so one of the things that I do in my coaching work with folks is, you know, once we've had our initial conversation and we're feel good about each other and they feel like I'd be a good fit and be helpful to them, um, I ask people to identify what their goals are. And what I find sometimes if you just do that, people can't get there. And so what I do is actually introduce to people. So if you were to achieve this goal, what might we be seeing, feeling, hearing, and experiencing when you get there? And then also what you might be doing so that it that taps into the imagination and the intention and helps people to start to create something that's a bit more tangible, feelable, doable. And it's much easier for us when we can move towards something, something that is concrete and attainable. Um, yeah. And with that, that creates some energy and some thrust and some drive to get ahead. Does, does that make sense? No, that makes a whole heap of sense. Because if you think about it, I mean, if you think about something as simple as a vacation, right? I mean, when you think about going somewhere, you think about, you start to imagine the experience, right? Yes. You know, the nice hotel, the beach or whatever. And then you say, okay, now I have to plan how to get there, right? You know, I have yeah. to save my money. I have to book my flights, whatever it is, uh, et cetera. So, but until you, un but you're never going to do all the planning and put all those pieces in place if you don't have that overwhelming feeling of that destination right. of what you want to experience, right? All right? And where you do take my attention to also, John, is this, is that what I have found in terms of helping people, well, through, through strategy work, for example, people are really good at thinking about the components, but connecting the dots is, is not so easy. And so mm -hmm. the other thing is this, as a checkpoint, and I find that's really useful for folks, is to do the initial work, clarify your goals, figure out what they are, probably validate and verify them with others to see if they're about the right size for stretch, not snap, as you, as you said. Mm -hmm. But also then you have to look at what's the process or the strategy that I have to employ to get to the goals. And so sometimes when I talk about that with more technically oriented engineers, I talk about it, you have to get the male and female parts to match, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have a strategy or a set of steps or process to match with the goals. And that each piece or every step that you take has to help you keep moving along that continuum. And the more that you have those pieces hooked up and lined up, the more you enhance your chances of succeeding, winning, meeting your goals. Yeah, and I, and I think that's and I think that's a very important point because I do think sometimes people do think that setting the goals is it. You know, I have my goals set, I've written them, I put them on the wall, I have them here, and this is what I'm working towards. But then they don't do, which is the harder work of actually mapping out the 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 path to to getting there. And I guess the other thing, Patrick, is like how how do people or how do you help people stay on track then? Because we get all excited, we set our goals, maybe we even set the steps to get there, but we might get distracted along the way. <laughs> uh, yes, we might. Uh, some people are more distractible than others. I mean, the answer is simply uh, checking. If you would. So I did this yesterday with a gentleman and I said, so we've done this. So we actually went back and looked at the goals and I said, so uh, what's enabled you to achieve the goals? You know, what, what's the fuel? What are, what are the tools, et cetera, that help? Okay, great. What do you need to do now to sustain them? So we took a look at that and we added some stuff. And then I said, so now what are some refinements and he's to, to those goals moving forward? So we keep moving the needle. And he hesitated. He had a little difficulty with that at first. And I said, I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that you change them. Because I think, A, clearly you're making good progress. B, you're engendering some success. Your boss thinks you're doing that. I'm just saying that we always have to keep moving forward. We have to keep paying attention. And we can't assume that we've crossed the finish line until we've crossed the finish line. So what are some of the modifications and changements we changes we want to make here to help you keep moving forward until we you know win the game so to speak and so i think that's another piece it's just checking back where are we looking how far we've progressed along the map and then seeing is there something else we need to add to help doing that 
And then also we sort of asking for and continuously getting feedback so we know that we're on course. Right. Yeah, and no, absolutely. And and I guess also that it's also important at, at points to revisit your goals and see if they need tweaking. I mean, if they need yeah. uh, have your priorities changed, have have other things come into play, uh, uh, because it should be a it should be a dynamic, uh, dynamic process, too. Well, well it, it, it has to be because the world, even though the goals might remain the same at inception, the world around us changes. Right there's a new person we have to work with, or there's a new customer, or there's a new competitor. Uh, the markets have changed. Um, Mr. Trump has forged or not forged an agreement with China, and it, the things change, mm -hmm. and so that will change what we're doing. Um, and you know, it's just like when I'm trying to get to a location, I pull out one of the maps on my phone, and I have that little dot. And I find as I'm moving, let's say I'm on foot or in the car, I follow the little dot and it helps me to see if I'm moving towards my goal or not. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a little bit like that. So the, you know, the map is not the territory, but it's awfully good to know where you are on the map, right? Yeah, and you mentioned something about uh, the, the having the not just the right strategy, but the cultural awareness to achieve goals. What do you mean by cultural awareness? Well, you know, it's interesting. In the recent past, I've read. Um, three totally different sources. Um, one of them happens to be this new book by Malcolm Gladwell called Talking to Strangers, mm -hmm. one by a doctor, one by someone else. And they all have the same thing uh, or the same philosophy which underlies it, which is saying, okay, if I really want to understand a situation, if I really want to progress and move forward, I have to make an assessment of the situation. So I'm in my company or in your company or I'm in California or I'm in New York. Mm -hmm. or I'm in California, or I'm in Tokyo. Secondly, what's the context? What is going on right now? And then what's the meaning of those things in that context? So, for example, um, there's a gentleman I was working with recently. Um, ironic, he's French. And he had tremendous success in his prior two companies. The third company he got to, he was having a lot of difficulty. And when we dug into it, what happened was he didn't notice or pay attention, I guess, to the fact that the prior places he worked inherently more assertive, more bottom line driven. Mm -hmm. This new place uh, was much more focused on doing things well, and doing things nicely, and they moved more slowly. And it was just a clear part of the culture. And he was pushing a little too fast and a little too hard for what his new colleagues could do, and it was creating some noise. So, and you know, here's my here's my philosophy, which is that if you were to take me from our meeting today and drop me in the middle of China, mm -hmm. I would know I was in a different culture because people would be looking somewhat different and they'd be speaking a different language. What I have found to be true is that cultures and companies or organizations are almost as different. Uh, because the rules of the game and how people do things and get things done, except that it's not as readily apparent until you dig below mm -hmm. the surface. So case yeah. in point for this gentleman, same kind of line of work, same kind of company, but the ethos or the culture in two places prior were much more driving and aggressive. This other place had a much slower pace to it that people wanted to get things more exact and more precise. So. And he was running into that and wasn't paying enough attention to it. And he was getting a lot of people irritated with it. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's an excellent point, then, is that you you do need to understand the culture around you in order to make in order to uh, help them to help you achieve your goals or achieve the company goals or whatever you have to understand. And and obviously, maybe over time, he can push them to be a little bit more assertive. But you obviously... Yeah you have to uh, gain their trust first, right? You know, actually, you're reminding me of one thing here, which is I remember uh, talking to a gentleman who was one of my sales mentors a number of years ago, and he was from New York, and he had just moved to your town, San Diego. Mm -hmm. And what he said he found out in the first two or three months of being in San Diego was that he said he would never, ever close another deal in San Diego if he kept up with his New York approach <laughs> to sales. 
And he really had, and I had another experience with a gentleman from Boston who had the same problem in Kansas City. And they hadn't paid enough attention to what are the mm. rules of how we do things here. And once they both did, things went a lot better. However, what I have also learned is that culture rules, it is always big, even if you're the new hire CEO, the culture of the organization is bigger, stronger, and more robust than you. So it is always up to you to adjust to the culture. The culture will not adjust to you. Yeah, exactly. All right, listen, this has been great, Patrick. Before Thank we you. go, though, I'd like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself, your organization, and what you guys do. Oh, great. So a uh, company is called Resources in Action. Uh, we're based in Berkeley, California. Most of our work primarily is coaching executives. Uh, and primarily our focus there is in a, a couple of places. One is we work a lot with people who are just about to get into the C team and they need to sort of fine tune, tweak and improve certain things. Uh, secondly, a lot of the work we do also focuses on helping people to develop their executive presence skills so that when they get in front of a variety of stakeholders, people want to listen to them they're interested in listening to them and they want to follow them. So that's the, that's the, that's the quick and easy version of it. And right. uh, I would say primarily we work in th mostly three types of organizations. Given we're in California, we do a lot of work with tech companies, no surprises. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a long history of doing work with folks um, in the healthcare uh, line of work. And through serendipity in the last couple of years, we've taken on a lot of work with folks in the construction business, which is mm -hmm. quite different. And yeah, very, I was gonna say, very there's a lot of, different, a lot of different cultures there. Uh, yes, yes, quite a lot of different, but you know, it's interesting. What I have found at the end of the day is that as people get to a certain level in the organization, and that's most of the people with whom we mm -hmm. work, primarily what they have to learn how to do is to communicate and influence with a high level of skill to a variety of people. Mm -hmm, and that sure. becomes the job, right? And the last thing I want to say is there's a fabulous book I read a number of years ago by Dan Pink called To Sell mm -hmm. is Human. Yeah. Which I think a lot of your folks would, would know about. Mm -hmm. and, you know, essentially he's mapped out a terrific process, in my mind, for how do you work your way through that and handle objections in a very skillful and subtle way. So it's, it's yeah. one of my Bibles, if you would. Excellent. Alrighty. Well, listen, yeah, listen, thank you, Patrick. My name is John Golden from Sales yeah. Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir.